Maternal Instinct, Chapter 3 My Life with Kimmy A broad smile was plastered on Monique's face as she drove through the streets of Milton. The smile was due to the fact that she was driving her own car. Her car. Not her family's. Hers. Added to the fact that it was a brand new car, and she couldn't help but laugh joyfully when she thought about it. Recently, it was supposed to be a graduation present from her father. But once he found out there was a limited time deal on this particular car, he couldn't wait. So, he gave it to her as an early present with the added stipulation that she keep her grades up until graduation. She had only the vaguest memories of agreeing to the deal before she jumped into the car and took it for a test drive. The test drive ended up encompassing most of the city, partially the hot spots of most of her classmates, and more importantly, the cute guys. She was showing off she knew, but she didn't really care. In fact, she had a right to show it off. It was a beautiful new convertible in a blazing red that perfectly matched her favorite dress. Her father had meant to take good care of the model, horsepower, and all the technical features she couldn't hope to understand. The only thing that mattered to her was that it looked good, and she looked good in it. After she finished cruising around the hotspots, she decided the next thing she had to do was show it off to Kim. The girl was just going to freak when she saw it. The thought made Monique's smile go wide as it threatened to split her face in half. Kim would insist on going for a ride. As soon as he picked her jaw off the ground, being such a good friend, how could she refuse? After all, how better to taunt a single man with two available women and a heart comparable? Hey, cutie! Working out already. See, saw how it smirk. She peeked over the top of her sunglasses into the rearview mirror to get a look at her new admirer. Personally, all she could see was the car he was driving. It was a blue Dodge Viper with a silver and red engine showing through the flame power painted on the hood. The windows were all tinted yellow, which made it hard for her to make out the driver. The fact that all the windows were up made her wonder just how he'd been able to call out to her. But she start shrugging off. Like what you see? She called back for her seriously. Oh yeah, looking good, mysterious driver complimented. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Not you, the car. Say what? When she looked in the rearview mirror again, she saw the driver was now closer to her rear bumper. A little too close. She stepped on the gas to try to put some distance between them, but he kept pace. So much he eventually noticed the bumper a few times. Thankfully, he wasn't cut enough to cause her to swerve out of control, but was freaking her out, especially the way he was doing it. It was almost like he was trying to nuzzle the car. She jerked the wheel to try to shake him off, but it did a little good. Oh, come on, babe! Don't be like that! He cried out. Monique almost screamed in frustration and was about to start hurling things from the glove department at the obsessive driver when the sounds of sirens split the air. Another look in the mirror confirmed that a police car style Lamborghini was coming up fast on the fiber behind her, her lights flashing brightly. She smiled broadly at the black and white car, and even more so when it forced to the other side of the road. Once he was out of danger, she slowed her car down as well, wondering if she should stop completely in case the officer was indeed ma making her statement. She stared back at the police car. Two things stuck out as odd in her mind. One, it had Japanese writing on the door. And more importantly, there was no one driving it. In fact, looking more closely at the Viper, she could make out why the driver had been so hard to see. There was none. She stared a second longer, before she flipped her seats back up and hit the gas again. I did not just see that, she told herself firmly. The rest of her trip was thankfully uneventful. Her earlier excitement returned as she pulled up to Kim's house. She practically jumped out of the car once it was parked in front of the possible residence, sprinted out the door. She took a few straight breaths to calm herself and make sure she stood between Kim's line of sight and her car. When she was sure that she was ready, she rang the bell. It took only for a moment for Mrs. Possible to answer the door. Oh, hi, Monique, she greeted tearfully. Hey, Mrs. Possible, is Kim here? Monique gasped, barely continuing her excitement. Well, she is, but... It's fine, Mom. Kim's voice spoke from behind her. You sure? Positive. Kim's mother looked for a second, then nodded, and let the two girls alone. Leaving Monique in a slight sea of confusion. It's quickly forgotten when she remembered why she dropped by, and her face scratched a smile again. Girl, I have a big surprise for you. She exclaimed cheerfully. Really? Because <laughs> I have one too, actually. My first, close your eyes. Kim quirked an eyebrow at the odd request, but complied nonetheless. She then felt Monique grab her wrist and led her outside. How far they walked to get stopped by the curb when her friend told her to go home in her eyes. 
as he did, as he found Monique leaning on the door to a brand new convertible, with a look of pride on her face to tell Kim everything she needed to know. Still, she was amazed by it all. How? She even has to say for a few seconds. My dad got it for me. Monique explained happily. It was supposed to be a graduation present, but, well, let's just say things worked out in my favor. <laughs> no kidding. Kim said as she ran her fingers along the door's edge. It's backing. I know. Come on. Let's cruise around town and some gas. Kim faltered to Sexton. She turned to her friend with downcast look. Sorry, Monique, but I can't. She said. Monique wanted to kick herself for being so stupid. Of course, Kim wouldn't want to go cruising for guys, because the girl was still reeling from her breakup with Ron. She mentally cursed herself as she stepped closer to Kim and placed an apologetic hand on her friend's shoulder. Sorry, girl. That was stupid of me, she said softly. I shouldn't have brought it up that soon after. Yeah. Kim sighed an acknowledgement of what she was talking about. That's part of it, but uh, there's something else, too. Oh, only gave her a sideways glance. It's actually my big surprise, but I think we should talk about it inside. This time it was Monique's turn to be confused, and led the way in good faith as she followed Kim back into the house. The stressed look on her friend's face told her something big was up. Or at least, she thought it had to be to cause Kim to seem so worried. It mattered a lot when she first broke up with Ron, actually. Whatever it was, she was determined to be with her friend. Maybe she couldn't go with her on world-saving missions, but at the very least she could provide a shoulder to lean on. When she entered the passable household, she was greeted with an unusual sight. A dark-haired, pale-green-skinned woman dressed in a black-green catsuit came walking groggily through the living room. She only made slight muttering noises to acknowledge either of the presences before she disappeared in the kitchen. Monique watched in stunned confusion, then turned to Kim who only looked embarrassed and uncertain. She looked back to where the woman had gone and peeked around the corner to try and get through her. She could swear she had seen her somewhere before. Kim, isn't that the woman whose picture you have in your locker? She asked, pointing towards the kitchen. A picture on a wanted poster? Uh, yeah. Their head remained simply. Look, you better sit down for this. It's a long story, and I'm not sure even I believe it when I really think about it. Onis' confusion only grew, but again she trusted her friend and sat down on the couch, Kim sitting next to her. When they settled in, Kim explained as best as she could how the other woman... Shigo ended up pregnant with a child that was partially hers thanks to Dragon's screw-up and was now going to be living with her family at least until the baby was born. Monita stared blankly and stared blinked several times as she tried to process the information. Her best friend was going to be the father to a baby that was carried by a woman who used to work for her arch rival and constantly beat her up while all the while trying to finish up the last year of high school, including Tear Squad and all of her other school activities, and, knowing Kim, still doing the world savior bit. <sighs> God, I love fancy. When she was finally able to wrap all of that around her brain, there was only one thing she could say. Well, you sure be my surprise. Kim was silent for a moment before laughing loudly. It was such strong laughter, she had to hold on to her side and fall back onto the couch. She didn't know why she was laughing so loudly, and she didn't really care either. After all that had happened to her yesterday, it was good to feel something other than confusion and anxiety. The fit lasted nearly two minutes when finally sustained and she looked up at Monique, who now even looked more concerned for her. She sat back up on the couch and shook her head in an attempt to calm her friend. I'm sorry, she said, wiping a tear from her eye. I know it wasn't that funny, it's just that... She paused and sighed. This has been a lot to take in, so I'm kind of out of it. This as long as you don't mean to have your mind, I think I can deal with it, Monique replied. Thanks. Like you said, no big. She paused. So, did you tell Ron about this yet? Oh, he was there when she told me. Oh, so, how did he take it? Well, she started and ran a hand nervously through her hair. We didn't really get much time to talk about it now. Like I said, it all happened pretty quickly. I think he was just about freaked out about it as I was. But you were able to get this girl to the hospital and bring her back here to convince your family to stay with you. The other girl said in a matter-of-factly voice. Yeah, I guess I was. I didn't really think about it, though. It just sort of happened. Like it was an automatic or giving in to your natural kimminess. Kim gave her a indignant look. You know... When you and Ron say it like that, it sounds like a bad thing. 
Gina fell back on the couch. Oh, but you're right. I didn't really think it through. I just sort of reacted. And now you're starting to regret it? Well, not really. It's just, I really don't know what I'm going to do. It's a lot to deal with, the dark-haired girl agreed. She looked over her friend and placed Rhea hand staring sand on her shoulder. But hey, I'm here for you. And even though there's still some weirdness, I'm sure Ron will be too. You're right. Kim nodded, feeling relieved for the first time since the other day. Honey nodded, as well as if she were going to allow Kim to feel relieved. The two slipped back into a comfortable silence, knowing that there was a lot to say that Kim was probably feeling overwhelmed about. Who wouldn't? Monique slipped an arm around her best friend and drew her into a hug. Actions speak louder than words, they say. And what better way to show support than a covering hug? Kim was naturally surprised by a gesture, but returned it all the same. Oh, how sweet! A snide voice came from a remark behind him. I think I'm going to be sick! Kim withdrew from the hug and glared at the person who made the offhanded comment. I know you don't like showing emotions, Chico, but you don't have to be... She sorry, but was cut one off by the woman in question. No, I'm really going to be sick! Chico replied, holding a hand over her mouth looking greener than usual. Bathroom! Down the hall, second door on the left. She ran out of the room without another word, leaving the two friends alone once again. Monique stared at the spot the green-haired woman was standing in a moment longer before turning back to Kim. I gotta ask, what's with that outfit? It's a super villain thing. I never understood it either. Kim replied with a shake of her head. I think it's the only thing she has to wear, which will probably be a problem later on when... She finished her thought by making a curving motion over her stomach. Yeah, it does look kind of constricted. Monique's eyes suddenly lit up. Ooh, girl, I just had brainstorm. We make a quick clip and air run and help your girl get some new outfits. Was that aren't skin tight and multicolored? Have you ever noticed your sassy black girl voice sounds a lot like your southern voice? <sighs> Trixie, I am not Mel Blanc here, alright? That much is certain. So, my apologies, but even working with the pony girls for the past four years, even I still have only a limited repertoire of female voices I can bring out. Kim scratched her nose at a thought. I don't know. That seems like it might be a bad idea. Although, she will need maternity clothes sooner or later. If they even have maternity clothes at Club Banana. You know what's funny? We don't sell those, but we do sell baby clothes. They're in that Platanian's line. Taking the banana thing a bit far, aren't we? Hey, was it my idea? Well, anyway, I'm not sure how much that'll help us. So, she placed her finger on her chin and thought. I suppose it wouldn't hurt to look through some baby clothes now, just to see what's out there. And Shigo could use some normal clothes to wear. I guess we'll just have to look elsewhere for maternity things. You could always try. Monique started, but Kim cut her off. Do not say Smarty Mart. I was going to suggest J.B. Nichols. I know they have some maternity things. Oh, Kim replied, embarrassed. Sorry, I guess I was expecting a wrong answer. Don't worry, but if anyone asks, I didn't tell you about it. Looks kind of bad when an employee tells one of our best customers to go to another store. My lips are sealed. Right after the agreement was made, Shigo came back into the room a little worse for wear. She made a few grunting noises towards Kim and Onique, before she plopped down into the recliner, usually reserved for Kim's father. Kim was about to correct it, but pushed back for it later. Instead, she decided to check on the woman's well-being. How are you feeling? She asked. A little better, but I gotta say, I'm not looking forward to throwing up most of what I eat. You're out of mouthwash, by the way, she so replied. I guess we'll have to pick up some up while we're out. Oh, the woman arts and I brought in a statement. Oh, going out somewhere, are you? Yes, we, Kim started, indicating her head towards Chico, are going to get you some new clothes. Oh, <laughs> really? And when did we come to this decision? Chico, please. You're going to need maternity clothes eventually, anyway. While you're staying here, it's probably best you don't wear that thing. The redhead made fake gestures towards the green and black cat suit. Hey, I'll have you know this is a file of staring at Stylus look. Yeah, a bad taste. Honey, I wouldn't be talking about taste if I was wearing a lime green tank top. Ooh, Ronnie grimaced. 
Kim only cast her sideways glance, and then returned to Shigo. This from the woman in a skin-tight leotard! She cowered. At least I'm not wearing boy pants! Kim looked like she was going to say something, but stopped and calmed herself with a shake of her head. She looked at Shigo again and spoke in the calmest voice she could muster. Look, we're going to the mall, and you can pick out whatever you want. I don't care, but we have to get maternity clothes, and we won't arouse suspicion. I'll let you borrow some of my clothes for today. I think we're about the same size. Just one question, Shigo asked. What? Since when did I become your new psychic to boss around? I'm not bossy! Kim read it shouted as he turned to Monique. Monique, am I bossy? Oh no, I'm not getting in the middle of this one. She replied, shaking her head, waving her hands. Well, she's smarter than your other sidekick, Shika remarked. Again, Kim found herself at a loss for words and merely let out a frustrated scream before marching off to her room. Shika looked at Monique with a smug smile. She knew the girl probably wouldn't understand what just happened, but she took much satisfaction in the fact that, in the same some way, she had won a fight with Kim Possible. Unfortunately, she also knew the princess was right. She needed something else besides her usual outfit to wear, especially when she started showing. Of course, that meant admitting that Kim had won away too, as he was definitely not going to let her know that. She would just find a way to make it seem like she really wanted to go to the mall all along. She couldn't help but have fun with a little girl. Yes, that would work perfectly. The other thing she was definitely was not going to do was wear anything of Kimmy's. She had seen some of the outfits the girl wore on missions. Hell, the missing clothes themselves left something to be desired. And none of it was right for her. Even if it was just for a few hours, for one day, there was no way she was going to wear them. No way, no how. Well, this is embarrassing, she got thought in dismay. She looked down at herself, and again started in disgust. After a prolonged verbal battle with Kim, she had finally convinced her to wear one of the younger woman's outfits, mostly due to her trump card, the puppy dog pout. A cliche when it comes to the Gilligan cut, but it works. Even with as cold as he could be at times, Shigo just wasn't able to say no to that face. It was just so... she couldn't think of what it was, but it was almost impossible to turn down to whatever request it wanted. If she was going to live with Kim for nine months, she would have to find some way around it. Her father was able to chew it down rather quickly. Maybe she could ask him for advice. That was a thought for earlier, though. A more immediate problem involved her state of dress. She convinced Kim that she had picked out this particular outfit just to spy her. The first major flaw of it was it mostly pink. Pink pants and a white t-shirt with a pink heart in front. She had always hated pink. It just seemed way too girly. Not that she ever saw herself as a true tomboy time, but pink just seemed so stereotypical. Not to mention the fact that the pale green and pink just didn't mix well at all. The other problem was that Kim had only been guessing what they were about the same size. For the most part, they were. But Shigo was slightly more developed than Kim. Thus, the shirt clung rather tightly to her bosom. It showed off slightly more than just her midriff. In fact, pretty much all of her stomach was exposed. She looked down again and ran her hand over her flat stomach subconsciously. Thank God I'm not showing yet, she mused. As much as the shirt seemed small and tight on her, the pants actually seemed to fit as well as they did on Kim. This made her wonder how the girl avoided having her pants fall off as much as the baboons did. There was a big enough gap in front of that Sika felt like she moved the wrong way, so she exposed more than her stomach. Thankfully, Kim had let her borrow a pair of panties to keep such things from happening, or at least less embarrassing. Actually, when she thought about what she believed Kim said, she could let her keep that pair. But Sika felt a little insulted by the insinuations. That could be dealt with later, though. Our immediate concern was that the people pointing and staring at her. Thankful, the usual hustle and bustle of a mall on Saturday kept most of the other customers from really noticing. But the few that did made her feel self-conscious. It wasn't the actual staring that bothered her. This is used to it by now. But rather than the clothes she had on making her feel too exposed. Her suit may conform to her every curve, but at least it covered all of her body. Was Kim's clothes most definitely did not. Again, it was not as if she wore a few risque outfits or swimsuits in the past, but that was she had control of the situation. Although those times she just wanted people to notice her body, 
but not a crowded public setting like this. She was nervous, and all that attention might cause some law enforcement personnel to realize who she was. How after all, there weren't that many pale, green-skinned, black-haired, plastic-spewing women walking around. She nearly left for joy when she, Kim and Monique, reached Kim and Banal, but still familiarly darting into the store. A little to do with the clothes inside, more in fact it offered her a place to hide if need be. So the clothes were still appealing, and it was the reason she was here after all. She did a quick sweep of the store to see if any police officers or undercover global justice agents were watching her. Once she was sure it was safe, she began to look through the clothing section. As though there were some good choices around, things would look a lot less firing on her before she started showing, and after the birth she had her way. Unfortunately, she wasn't the only one making the decision. Far too soon for Chico's taste, Kim came over and started discussing ideas that they, what kind of clothes he could buy. This naturally led to another fight between the two of them. In fact, most of the intended shopping spree was taken up by your almost constant bickering. Most of it consisted of Shigo telling Kim not to boss her around, and Kim saying she was only trying to help. The back and forth pattern continued for almost an hour, twin sets of emerald eyes burning brightly as they glared at one another. It only escalated when he looked at the baby clothes. Aside from Shigo saying it was too early to be thinking that, she also refused anything that had even been the slightest bit of pink on it. Kim thought it was traditional, while Shigo thought it was stereotypical. That fight ensued that only brought them all security to play, before Monique was able to calm the two down. Mommy, look at that! Now, dear, do not watch the couple quarreling. It's not right. You shouldn't point and stare at them. After much, much bickering, the two finally agreed on an extensive wardrobe for Shigo. And by agreeing, of course, that meant Shigo ignoring all of Kim's suggestions and going what was CY to buy. Even more distasteful to the younger redhead was the fact that Shigo paid for her items with a credit card tied to her various bank accounts. Accounts Kim cared little for, since they were filled with money either stolen or given as payment for evil deeds. Both options made her skin crawl slightly at the thought of being used to help her child. Sadly, she had little option at the moment, but she swore to herself that that would change by the time the baby was born. By the time the outing was finished, the most worn out of the group was Monique. Having to be the referee for the two-spirited woman made her remember some of the babysitting jobs she had with bickering siblings, or rather, more like an old married couple. Either way, keeping them from tearing each other's throat out was an exhausting job, as he looked forward to going home and resting for a bit. Idly, as he was wondering if she was going to be able to provide Kim the support she could need through this ordeal, but rationalized it by telling herself it would be better to prepare next time. Still, she hoped the two would learn to behave around each other real quick. As the trio left Club Banana and walked through the rest of the mall, they failed to notice the set of eyes staring at them with malicious glee. Even Shigo's well-trained vision had missed in Kim's other rival, but having never seen nor heard of the girl before, how could she pay attention to the brunette? The same girl that was currently watching them was wearing a smile more devious than anything she could come up with. Just as Shigo was nervous about people watching her in the mall, so too was Kim worried about her classmates staring at her as she sat at her useful table in the lunchroom. In her case, it was slightly more justified, though by any of them watching her. For the most part, it had to do with her choice of lunchtime company, specifically one Ron Stoppable. It wasn't odd to see the two together by any means, but given what happened between them, most of the students assumed they would keep their distance for a while. That had been true, for the most part during the last half of the summer, but by the time school had started, they worked out their differences to the point where they could be friends again. What made the situation most frustrating and confusing was the fact that it was the talk of the school. In fact, their entire relationship, from the kiss they served at the dance last year to their breakup, was a hot topic, even going so far as to have an article written in a school paper about it. Like most things in the high school, the other kids preferred spreading rumors among themselves rather than ask higher than what actually happened. Some of the rumors said Kim had been too bossy to, towards Ron, while others suggested that Ron wasn't able to hold Kim's address. Some had seen him cheating on her with Monique, while others had her cheating on him with some super studs she might have met in another country. Yeah, Ron's not the change type. The most accurate were the ones that implied that things just didn't work out between them. Fortunately, those rumors were the most prevalent, and generated a great deal of sympathy for the duo. Mostly due to the general idea that they had was the true love scenario, 
A guy and a girl who are best friends all their lives, finally realizing their true feelings for each other and falling in love. It was supposed to be a happy ending, but seeing things didn't always turn out the way they were supposed to. The odd side effect of it all was that Ron suddenly became a veritable girl magnet. Became? Please. This guy has been shipped with almost every single female on the show. I mean it. If you put in Ron and put in romance chips, I guarantee you... 65% of them are with Kim. Then you got ones with Shigo, DNA Amy, Monique, Bonnie, Yuri, that girl at the ticket ca counter whose name I can't remember, but god damn it, she wasn't cute! Oh, let's see. Mrs. Stoppable. Let's see. Let's see some random girl girls. Oh, oh, and uh, that one girl who was all about uh, excitement. The head of the uh, global justice. The etc. 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 I think he, he's been even crossover shows a few times. Guarantee you, one of those are going to be with. Don't say it. Sailor Moon. Oh, come on! Why am I like one of the most shipped girls out there in these crossovers? Girls that wouldn't give him a second look before, or one that or that was matter, were now casting Cylon guesses during his way during classes, and especially here at lunch. Some of the girls who had turned him down before admitted they had been wrong and apologized. For some of our reason, it seemed not being able to hold on to the great Kim possible made Ron more attractive to the girls of Milton High. So it was whenever that the two would take their seats in the cafeteria, they were met with stares from the other students, ranging from sympathetic to confusion, and in some cases, vortices. While Kim usually felt a little more comfortable and self-conscious under their gaze, today she hardly knows them. Instead, she sees fixated on the mostly knolls of discolored claws of meat that the lunch lady claimed were spaghetti and meatballs. She sighs, he accidentally puts the noodles around in a fiery sauce with her fork. What's wrong, KP? The voice broke through her haze in her mind. It caused her to look up at the person who asked the question. There she saw both Ron and Monique giving her concerned looks. Even Rufus took time out from his sneaking to see if he was alright. She felt a little embarrassed at all the intention and tried to nonchalantly wave it off. It's nothing, you guys, she said half heartedly. Really, n no big. <laughs> really? Nothing at all? Like an evil psychic curry and your virus created baby? Ron asked suspiciously. No, of course not. That is so not a drama. Ron and Monique looked at each other unconvinced. All right, it is big, and it is still the drama! Kim admitted after a moment and laid her head down on the table. Then she tilted her head so only her eyes showed and stared at the two sadly. Help me. Hey, come on, KP. Ron said, placing a comforting hand over hers. We're here for you. I mean, I may not agree with it and find the whole thing sick or wrong, but I'm here for you. Believe that, girlfriend. Monique added emphatically. Here for you 100%. I mean, who was it that took you and that seagull girl shopping over the weekend? And who kept you two for tearing each other's heads off? That was you, Kim replied softly. And who was it that was there for you when you took her to the hospital? Ron answered. That was you. But you said we should just leave her and run. As far as fast as we can, if I remember correctly. Hey, I panicked! He said in his own defensive. I mean, it was weird and potentially dangerous situation, and I tried to avoid those. <laughs> Since when? She asked, now sitting up right. Since, since it started to fall, Shigo having your baby through some weird dragon thing. I mean, you gotta admit, that's weird, even for us. Yeah, I know. But this is gonna happen either way, and I guess... You guess what? I guess it all hit me at once today. I mean, I'm gonna be a mother. Or father, or whatever. The point is, I'm going to have to raise a child. With Shigo, no less! Ron pointed out before he took a bite of the meatball on his fork. And that's another thing. Kim Sire ran her hair to her hair nervously. I have to try to get her to calm down. Not only is he actually going to give birth to the baby, she's also going to be living with my family. I just need to keep her from being so, so, she go like. Yeah, and when I bring up the subject of being her a little less, she go like, she. Starts in with the sound and the fussing, Money gasped, yeah. Kim agreed again and sighed. 
I just don't know what to do. This whole thing is just so overwhelming. I just I want my child to be born and grown up safely. I know I can't share that, but Seagull, I don't know. You could always fight for sole custody. Given your past, and especially Seagull's, I'm sure the courts would be on your side, Ron suggested. I probably could, but it doesn't seem right. The baby Seagull's as much as mine, and I don't want to take it away from her. She just... Hey, Kim! A new voice spoke out from behind her. Kim's body stiffened at the sound of voice. She slowly turned around in her chair to come to face to face with her other arch rival, Bonnie Rockwaller. The devilish Burnett's face told Kim the girl was ready to lay into her with her latest dig. Something she was definitely not in the mood for. Not now, Bonnie, she growled, turning back around. I just wanted to say how sorry I was for missing you at the mall on Saturday. Bonnie started, voice dripping with Melissa's glee. Oh no. Kim thought in horrified realization. But I did manage to catch you there with Monique and some other woman, who I believe you're shopping for clothes for. I couldn't really tell what the fighting you were doing, so if you ask me, it looked like more like a lover's spat. So, what happened? Stoppable messed you up so bad that you gave up on men altogether? Is Little Miss Perfect playing for the other team now? And what about the baby clothes? Is there something else you're hiding? Halfway through, Kim closed her eyes and tried her best to tone the obnoxious girl out. But her friends could tell by the way she was shaking with anger, gripping the table hard enough to break it off for her fingers. It wasn't working. They tried to keep the inner feet and seemed from turning ugly, but it was too late. Bonnie! Shut up. What was that? Bonnie continued, oblivious to the situation. Didn't quite catch that, Kay! I said shut up! She shouted, jumping out of the chair, came right into Burnett's face. I'm tired of hearing this. In fact, everyone's tired of hearing this. I never understood what your problem with me is. And to be honest, I don't care. Neither does anyone else, if you haven't noticed. Ever since the dance last year, when I mean, you tried to make fun of Ron and I for finally become a couple. Or do you not remember how everyone basically shunned you? Or how they've been shunning you ever since we got back? Or even when we broke up and you again tried to rally people to your cause because you failed? You want to know why? Because people are just sick of it. They finally realize that this attitude of yours doesn't make you cool or popular. It just makes you mean-spirited and petty. Not to mention pathetic. If that's what you are, Bonnie. You're just pathetic. Instead of sniping back with a wary reply or cutting remark, Bonnie instead stood there in silence with her mouth hanging up and eyes as big as saucers. This sentiment, and in some cases expression, was shared by the state of rest of the cafeteria as they, sta as they stared upon the red-headed girl dumbfounded. It was while he knows she could be quick to anger, as she was a redhead after all, but this outburst stunned them all. The person feeling the most effective for us was, of course, Bonnie. She tried several attempts at a comeback, but her mouth just flapped up and down uselessly. This was not the way it was supposed to go. She would make some snide remark, Kim would make a comeback, this would continue for a bit, and then they go their separate ways. But the attack Kim does laid on her was too much. There was no way she could respond to it, mostly because she knew it was true. Ever since the dance last year, she became the school's new pariah. Everyone turned her against her. Her friends, the cheer squad, even the freshmen knew to avoid her. Whereas she had once been one of the most popular girls in school, she was now part of its outcasts. Even they wouldn't take her in after the way she treated them for years on end. So, knowing she had been beaten, Bonnie simply sighed and slumped her shoulders as she walked off, found an open and empty table. Kim continued to stare at Bonnie until she sat down, then finally back to her own table. She picked up the chair and sat down again. When she did, she found Ron, Monique, and Rufus still giving her the wise side stare silent treatment. What? She snapped. They looked at each other for a second. It was a silent decide who should be the one talking to her. Not surprisingly, it was Ron. He sighed and braced himself for the worst. Ron, what are you doing? Kim is a little bit miffed. Hold back. Hold back! Um, Kim, don't you think it was a little much? I mean, I know Bonnie's a pain and all, but... He stated gently. She asked for it, Kim replied. Besides, I have enough to worry about right now, without putting it with Bonnie being, well, Bonnie. 
I know, but the way you handle it was kind of, kind of what? Seagull-like? He offered, ducking his head down a bit. Uh-huh, uh-huh, Seagull. Rufus agreed. You know, it's scary how many times you perfect that voice. Thanks, Trix. This time it was Kim's turn to stare open mouth shock. She obviously didn't think about it at the time, but looking back now, the reaction did seem a lot more along the lines how Shigo would have handled it. This thought scared her more than anything she could remember. She thought about being around Shigo was a positive influence on the pale-skinned woman. But what if it was an actual negative influence on her? What if instead of calming down and asking more like Kim, Kim actually started acting more like Shigo? She shook her head violently at the idea. No, that won't happen, she muttered. What will happen? Lenny gasped, looking very concerned to say the least. But then Kim realized that the last statement out loud, and suddenly felt embarrassed. She looked at her two friends again and tried to shrug it off as discreetly as she could. Nothing, really. I can handle it, she told him. Again, Anik and Ron looked at each other with concerned expressions. She goes to it before the full-length mirror in her room in the possible household. It was one of the things she acquired during her outing with Kim and a friend this weekend. Other items include a new stereo, a couple of CDs and DVDs, a few other things she insisted she needed. Of course, a lot of them she didn't really need, but it was fun to drag Kimmy around the mall. At least when she allowed herself to be dragged around. When she didn't, well, she goes secretly wished that she was still in condition for a physical fight. Still, living with the possibles wasn't all that bad. Especially at times like this when she had the house all to herself. She was actually amazed at how trusting the family could be just based on Kim's word. Hell, Kim trusting her was a big shock in herself. She was still a wanted criminal and attacked the girl many times. For all the cheerleader knew, she could set up a trap in her own very home. Or she could just steal whatever she wanted and take off like that. Of course, the family didn't really have anything worth stealing, and she had no places to go. Plus, there was a part of her that didn't want to betray Kim's trust. It's been a long time since anyone trusted her, let alone a former enemy, and it felt odd, but in a good way. Personally, it also left her with very little to do during the day when everyone else was gone. There was usually nothing to go on TV during the middle of the day, and she was still trying to figure out what she could eat without immediately throwing up afterwards. So she opted to finally do what she didn't really do want to do. Put away her trademark green and cat, black cat suit. Oh, Guys, her stomach's not going to be able to take it. We know! She stood in the full-length mirror and placed the left corner of the room with the suit held in front of her. She decided how good it looked against her body at the moment, but knew those days were quickly coming to the end. Slowly, she moved to the side and studied her almost bare body. She was clad in a lacy bra and massy panties that she bought during her recent outing, and she looked good in. This, too, would change soon enough. I don't know. I mean, you would still look good. It's just that you'd be a little bit bigger, and, you know... Down, boy! Down! Down! <laughs> it's swears. That, though, drew her to the source of her worrying. Her stomach. Right now, it was taunt and lean, a perfect athletic build. In a few months, it would start to bulge out, and expand as the life she carried inside her grew. This too felt odd, as she had always gone great lengths to keep her body in top shape. She just couldn't picture herself with a huge gut, even if it wasn't due to fat. Still, it would slow her down and keep her from doing anything, really. As much as she did like to lie around and take it easy, she didn't like the idea of not being able to fight, not being able to protect herself. She especially didn't like the idea of having to depend on others for help and doing simple tasks. She hated being helpless, and that's exactly what she would be. Adding to all that worry was the fact that she had no idea how to raise a child. Kim might have offered to help, but she didn't have any more clue than Shigo. Maybe it was for the best she stayed there for a while after all. At the very least, she could ask Kim's parents for advice on raising a child. Though, that would require more, spending more time with them, and for what she got gathered... They were already worth slightly odd. At least her father was. Mother seemed perfectly normal. Plus, she's gone through this three times before, so I'm sure she could help some, she got thought. Then she placed a hand over her stomach. Something she seemed to be doing a lot lately. Not or even born yet, and you're already giving me trouble. Hope this isn't going to be a pattern later on in life. Of course, knowing how I was as a kid, I wouldn't be surprised. Look, 
I'll make you a deal. If you promise not to act up too much, I promise not to be all overly protective and strict mom. I'm sure Kim will fit that role anyway. I'll be the fun mom who lets you get away with us a little bit more. Sound good? Of course, she received no reply. It shook her head and confused at her own actions. She figured it was just her hormones starting to go wonky on her. She refocused her attention on the suit in her hand, and continued with what she originally planned. She walked over to the bed and placed the outfit next to an open suitcase and carefully folded it up. She stored it in a large steel suitcase next to where she already laid out the gloves, boots, and ankle pouch. Then closed it and slid it underneath the bed. She'd been so careful because she figured this would be her last suit in a long time. She didn't want to damage it in any way because she swore to herself Sunday she would wear it again. She didn't know when or in what capacity, but she would wear it again. Someday. Kim smiled as she entered the house. It always felt good to come back after a mission, mostly because it felt good to make it home from a mission. But being home also made her feel safe, relaxed. If anything, it may seem like all the Macy she did see was part of a daily routine. Get up, get dressed, go to school, saw some crazy madman's latest take over the world scheme, come home, have dinner with the family, go to bed, repeat the next day. What she thought about it, the way it was actually kind of humbling. This is good because it kept her getting a swelled head, like a certain someone she knew. But she will worry about that later. Right now, she planned to enjoy part of her routine where she spent time with her family, particularly a nice home-cooked meal. That is, if Shigo had burned it all again. That thought made her stop for a second. It had been two months now since he found out the ex-villain was carrying her child, and invited her to life with her family. As he figured, the first few weeks would be most difficult. Shigo fought her on almost every success that he made, the first trip to the mall being the worst of it. From there, the arguments consisted of what she could and couldn't do, why she had to go see Dr. Anderson like she says he would, helping out around the house as much as she could, and oddly enough, a rather intense fight about astronauts versus cavemen. Out of that entire list, though, house chores seemed to be the biggest problem. For all the complaining Shigo did about being bored through most of the day, she was still very adamant about helping out around the house. Something about not wanting to become too domesticated and Donna Reed-like. Kim just figured it was another excuse for her to be lazy. Though, the incident where she nearly burnt the house down while trying to help her mother cook dinner might be proof she was telling her the truth. Fortunately, she calmed down in the following weeks to the point where she was bearable. They still had the actual verbal spat, which Kim figured would go on for a long time. It was because an animosity between the two of them couldn't be swept under a rug because they were having a child together. They were trying to work it out all, though, because they were having a child. The one thing they seemed to agree on was to not mess up his life too badly. Still, she knew a few arguments would pop up from time to time. But for the most part, they seemed to be getting along fairly well, considering their past relationship. Even more surprising, Shigo seemed to, at the very least, be able to tolerate her family. She wasn't quite on friendly terms yet, especially her annoying brothers, but she at least didn't think of them as the enemy anymore. As least she seemed to get along quite well with her mother, it was just disturbing in its own right. Again, she fake with these thought, thoughts and head to her room for a quick change. She headed back down the stairs into the kitchen. She detected the unmistakable meaning scent of her mother's famous brain loaf. She cringed just a bit. She knew it was the only way the tweeds would eat it, but was still kind of freaking out. Thankfully, she heard the knocking sound of metal hitting wood, which meant her mother was busy cupping festivals for a salad or some other kind of alternative. She was grateful for that and ready herself to help her mother in preparations she needed. What she was not ready for was the sight that greeted her when she entered the kitchen. It was the sight that made her stop dead in her tracks and go to wide disbelief. There were not many things in this world that scared her, but definitely one of them. There, in her very own kitchen, stood her mom side by side with Shigo, counting up festivals and tagging it up like old friends. Now she became used to having Shigo in the house, it did encourage her to get to know her family a bit more. But this was just wrong. Sick and wrong, even. Something about the scene just gave off a very foreboding feel about it, one that only increased her starting there, and Shigo took her there with a devious grin. Well, look who's finally back, she practically purred. Oh, hi, Kimmy, her mother half greeted. Yes, hello, Kimmy, she continued, grinning and growing larger. Mom, 
What did you tell her? Kim asked, immediately suspicious. I didn't tell her anything. We were just talking. Mrs. Possible replied. About what? Just a story about a future world saver who seemed to have a problem keeping her dress on when she was much younger. She go gust, barely containing her laughter. Mom! Kim shouted, her cheeks are simply going red. Oh, what? It was cute, Mrs. Possible said off handedly. It was at that point, she completely lost it and laughed uproariously. She laid down the knife she was holding, and instead held the hand against her face, leaning her head back. Kim gritted her teeth and balled her hands into fists as she fumed over the incident. She liked nothing more than to jump over the counter and drop kick Shigo in the face right now. But she knew she couldn't do that. Instead, she took a deep, calming breath and thought another way she could retaliate. And what are you doing in this kitchen, Shigo? I thought you were banned after that whole barbecue incident, she said. That caught Shigo's attention. She immediately stopped laughing and glared at the other woman. Hey! That was that one time! I've been getting better since then, she retorted. It's true. She improved quite a bit. Mrs. Possible spoke. Whose side are you on, Mom? Kim asked indignantly. I'm not on anyone's side. I'm just staying a fat. Plus, I don't think you two should be fighting anyway. Can't be good for the baby. That statement made the two go silent. Mostly because they knew she was right. They each muttered something about apology before helping with dinner again. Shigo returned to cutting vegetables while Kim started to set up the table. As she did so, she cast a few glances Shigo's way. The pale woman had given up on her usual form loving leotard two months ago and taken it to work her wearing clothes, so she kept her black and green pairs. Currently, she was wearing an overly large dark green sweater and a pair of black sweatpants. She started wearing baggy clothing recently because she was still self conscious about the fact her privacy was starting to show. Park Kim could understand it. She knew that it was like her. She got took pride in her lean, athletic appearance, but another part of her thought it was silly. There's no reason for her to be ashamed of carrying a new life, even if it did expand to you a bit. In fact, some cultures thought it made the woman more attractive. Of course, she knew Shigo was too vain to admit that. Her head snapped up in that line of thought made her remember something that would have happened that day. So, how did the appointment with Dr. Anderson go? She asked. Pretty well, Seagull replied as he set the bowl of salad on the table. Basically told me the same thing about keeping my plasma blasts down until I had to absolutely use them. And everything else was pretty normal, surprisingly. Surprisingly? Oh, come on! This whole thing came from one of Dracus' experiments. I can't believe the, oh, I was the only one who thought something would go wrong. Well, Kim muttered, rubbing her left arm nervously. Anyway, Seagull spoke again. The doc said she looks pretty healthy at this stage. See? Yeah, the older woman replied, slightly annoyed at the repeated questions. Again, can't be a surprise we're having a girl. Virus came from both our DNA and we're both girls. True, but if it's a girl, that means no pink! Just a little, please! I said no! Well, I... Kim, why don't you tell your father that he, the, in the voice that dinner's ready? Mrs. Possible asked, hoping to stop another fight. Kim and I went about finding the rest of her family. It didn't her take her too long to find their way to the kitchen table, especially their brothers. They all quickly took their useless places with Shigo sitting next to him. As of everything in the past two months, it took them a while to get used to the arrangement, but now it seemed to come naturally. Though Kim was still a little leery after a well-placed plasma burst caused her to jump and spill food all over herself. After the food was divided between them, they hesitated before starting eating. Shigo looked cautiously at them, and wa wondered if they were going to start out breaking the prayer. What's everyone leaning on? Haven't you figured it out yet? Figured what out? As a response to her question, a familiar blonde-haired head stuck appeared in the kitchen's doorway. All a possible family! Ron greeted as he stepped into the room. Of course! Shigo muttered. Shigo? He said curtly when he noticed her. Here again, stoppable. Don't you have your own family to annoy? Yes, but I have an open invitation to be here whenever I want. It just so happens that my mom's cooking can't match his Dr. P's cooking. Oh, Ron, please, Mrs. Possible said, feeling somewhat embarrassed. I'm sure your mother's cooking isn't that bad. I mean, you cook well enough, and you've helped out here a few times. 
Yeah, I know, but for some odd reason, Mom just doesn't like me cooking at home. Ron explained as he took the open chair on the other side of Kim. I think she's just jealous. So, let's see. You can't keep a girlfriend, you know how to cook, and you have a very phallic pet. Seagull remarked, taking off each eye on her finger. Yeah, I think I'm starting to see a pattern developing here. Hey! Ron shouted as Rufus climbed out of his pocket. Foggy. Yeah, hmm. The naked ram will shout as well. Chuckled Seagull at her own joke. Stopped by a quick poke in the wrist by Kim. She glared at the younger woman, but did nothing else. The possible parents bring a sigh of relief that the argument hadn't turned to something larger. And after serving a plate for Ron, they began to eat. The room was still filled with a clanging of metal against porcelain plates, and I heard chatter of small talk centering on everyone's day. Oh yeah! Ron spoke up. That baby thing was today, right? How did that go? Pretty good from what I hear. Kim answered, casting a glance at Shigo. The baby's completely healthy. Booyah! Things going good for the possible baby! You do remember I'm actually having the baby, right? Seagull said sardonically. Yeah, but I didn't think I had to worry about you, cause, you know, you're tough. Ron defended himself. That's true. She then looked over at Mrs. Possible. Since we're subject on the hospital, how did it go with that Dr. Cox guy? Perry, he's just... Mrs. Possible started to reply. Then stopped once he noticed Jim and Tim were listening. Well, I better not say what the boys hear. Aww! Maybe, but I still think he's a... She stopped suddenly and held a hand over her mouth as her cheeks ballooned up. With another word, she jumped from the seat and her head was raised to the bathroom. Everyone but Ron seemed amazed by the event. Well, that was rude, he muttered. Don't worry about that. It's just the baby acting up, Mrs. Possible said offhandedly. I went through the same thing when I was pregnant with Kimmy. Couldn't keep anything down. She was so picky. Mom, please! Kim pleaded. Can't you just limit it to one embarrassing story a day? When Ron cried tonight about the comment, she just gave him a look that told him to drop the hot topic or else. He complied as the group went back to their meals. After a while, Seagull went back to the kitchen and muttered an almost comprehensible apology. While to the fridge, it began pulling out a few items. She moved to the paste pantry for two slices of bread. They all watched as he put together a sandwich that was simply horrifying. Is that... Kim started. Now I'm sure she could finish the sentence without having to run to the bathroom herself. Yep. Mayonnaise, pickles, ham, peanut butter, and jelly. What's wrong with that? That sounds like a perfectly reasonable sandwich. Trixie, you put chili powder on your peanut butter bread. Yes, and... Seiko finished, holding up the sandwich in question, defending herself by saying, Cravings. Cool, Tim and Tim said together. We have to try one. Yeah! Not until you finish your dinner, Possible and reprimanded, and you're cleaning any mess you make. This seemed to dissuade the boys from trying the new confectionery concoction they just learned about. Seiko just shrugged it all off, <laughs> walked out to the living room to finish her sandwich in front of the TV. It was a slight wave of nausea passed. Possibles and Ron continued on with their own meals, eating and chatting about the day. When dinner was over, Kim helped to clear the table and put the dishes in the washer before she walked out to the living room to check on Shigo. She found her just finishing the last bits of her sandwich, and as crushing her face, Kim sat down next to her. Feeling better? She asked. Yeah, a little. I don't think I'll ever get used to these weird cravings, though. Shigo replied, her face twisted a bit in disgust. Yeah, try not to talk about it that much. It... Just don't talk about it. Seiko nodded in agreement and the two sat in silence for a moment as they watched TV. So, mom let you back into the kitchen, huh? Look, I told you it was just that one time! I figured out how to cook things without setting out a house on fire! Seiko erupted to fold her arms over her chest and slept a bit. Besides, and it's only going to be chop festivals and stuff now anyway. Kim chuckled a bit. But stopped when something Seiko said hit her heart. Wait, Anne? You're calling my mom Anne now? She asked graciously. Yeah, but that is her name, isn't it? Yeah, but it, it's just... What happened to the whole, I don't think family's for me, Kimmy? Redhead asked. You know your best impersonation of the other woman. She just shrugged. Your family's not as irritating as mine. Well, except your brother's. Guess I'm finally starting to get used to it here. Though, I'm still not partaking in family game night. 
she said, certainly gave her a shudder. Fair enough. As long as you try to be nicer to Ron. Kim said sincerely. Making no promises. Kim sighed and leaned back against the couch. She supposed for now it was the best reply she was going to get. She just wished she knew how to get the two to find some common ground outside of her. That way maybe she could build it up to at least a mutual understanding between the two of them. So she wouldn't have to worry about her baby being pulled in some weird tug of war. Since so he wasn't going to have enough to worry about having two mothers and all. Hey, KP! Time, it's 9 o'clock! Time to switch it to! Ryan screamed as he came to marching into the room, but stopped when he spotted Shiga holding the remote. Alright, lady. Hand over the remote. I need to turn the channel. Shiga snorted. <laughs> you gonna watch some stupid wrestling or something? Think again, possible. Besides, who's the one that actually lives here? And who's the one that is old Kim since pre-K? And try not to kill her this all the time. And was staying here for a while. Ron, I don't think that's Kim trying to say. Who's the one having her baby? She go countering. She go, really, that's... Who's the one that helped her fight you all these years? Ron sneered. Oh, is that what you were doing? I thought you were running around screaming like an idiot. Please, you guys. Well, at least I'm not... Whatever Ron was going to say was cut off by an announcer on TV. It's time for America's Star Maker! Oh good, this is what I wanted to see. He said, seeming to forget all about his argument, and sat next to relief Kim. As the street stared for a TV for a moment, the situation really sank in. Wait a minute, you watched this? Both Ron and Chico shot in surprise, pointing fingers at each other. Well, yeah, Ron replied. Didn't you all see me win almost that one time? Doi, I was there, Seagull remarked. Besides, your competition for tonight was Draken. Not really much to go up against. Well, still, I was better. Whatever. She rolled her eyes. Just be quiet and starting. Must have given surprise and again relief. Ron did what he was told and watched the show in relative silence. A smile growled slowly and worked away over Ken's mouth at the scene of Ron and Seagull actually sitting next to each other without trying to attack each other. Looks like he found their common ground after all. It wasn't the best of common grounds, but at least it was a starting point. Later that evening, Kim sat alone in her room and tapped the end of her pencil patiently on the desk. The one thing she had always hated about having a mission during the week was the fact that she had to end up doing her homework at late in the night. That's exactly what she was doing at the moment, and her sleep-deprived mind was having a hard time coming up with the answer to the problem on the page. She debated just leaving it for tomorrow morning. But that meant she had to get up earlier to finish it, and she wanted, and needed, all the sleep she could get. When the familiar tone of the communicator reached her ears, she wasn't sure to be happy or resentful. Dee dee dee! She has a way to get out of homework, regardless. She reached over and picked up the device. Turning it on, she did so. <laughs> What's the sit wait? She asked. You got a PM on your site! The boy genius replied. Don't suppose he can wait till morning, will it? It's for Dr. Director. This got Ken's full attention. Dr. Director herself. And not one of her useful contacts? Kim asked with a sweep. Yep, she says it's urgent. And she needs to speak to you right away. By right away, you mean whether Jess is on his way to you right now. She sighed. Of course. Thanks for the heads up, Wade. He nodded before ending the transmission. Kim stood up and stretched. Lay got surprisingly loud and long on. She recovered quickly and went about putting on her missing clothes just in haste. She carefully made her way downstairs and out the front door so not wake up anyone else in the house. No sooner as she stepped onto the lawn did a global justice personal jet sit down silently in the street. She smiled at the timing and stepped up to the ship, fired the extended stairs. The smile quickly disappeared once she came face to face with her least favorite J GJ uh, agent. Will, she half greeted. Kimberly, will do, replied from the seat. Don't suppose you can tell me what this is about? She so asked as he took her seat from across his. Unfortunately, no. Dr. Director told me little I could meet you here, since I am familiar face to you. Wonderful. I just hope this doesn't take too long. I really need to get my homework done and get some sleep. As usual of highly trained and smug agent, didn't say anything in response. In fact, he said almost nothing for the entire time of their flight. What thankfully Kim was short. After touching down one of GJ's hidden hangers, 
as he followed through as he led her through the busy halls of Global Justice Headquarters. The agents around them were much too busy to acknowledge them, and then those who did only offered quick and polite nods. Will stopped in front of a large double metal doors with a gold nameplate reading Dr. Director, one on the right door. They slid open almost as soon as Kim stepped up to them, cast a glance at Will, and simply motioned for her to go inside. She hesitated for a second, but did as he was instructed and watched the large, spacious room. While most of the metal grade walls were bare, a small corner posted an impressive array of metals, accommodations for bravery. Near these sat a large wooden desk covered in files, pencils, and an inbox full of papers. Sitting behind it in a comfortable looking chair was the one eyed, stern physicist of Dr. Director. Kim Possible, good to see you again. She greeted the team her own formerly. Nice to see you, Dr. Director. Kim replied as she stepped over to the desk and held out her hand. The older brunette took the offered hand in her own, and after a quick shake, told Kim to sit down in a smaller, less comfortable seat in front of her desk. Again, the redhead did so, stared up at Dr. 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 Director and hit his pace in. So, what's up? She asked. Before growing, he used the cat's phrase out of respect. There's something I need to ask you, Dr. Director replied. Oh, what's that? She answered by pressing a button on the wall behind her, lining up with pictures of Kim and Shigo walking around the mall to buy clothes, going out for groceries. A few times Kim had convinced her to go to Boyo Nazo. Various other things he had down into the past few months. A sinking feeling suddenly overcame Kim. As she started to visit around nervously. She should have known that eventually GJ would come along asking about this. But she had been far too busy to really think about it. Even if she had, she doubted that any less anxious than she did right now. Mainly, I want to know why international hero Kim Possible is seen here and about with an international criminal Seiko. A woman who's been as much a threat to you as her former employer. Dr. Director asked, leaning forward to place her hands on the desk and staring at Kim with her one good eye. Kim squirmed even more as she tried to think about what was tell the imitating woman. She knew the truth was the best way to go, but somehow, telling it to the head of an international crime-finding organization just didn't seem like it enough. She thought that she could have a better explanation than that. In many ways, it was like talking to Mr. Barkin when she was late for class. Well? It's like this, Kim started feeling uneasy. About three months ago, Dr. Draken created a virus with mine and Shiko's DNA that was supposed to get me pregnant, but ended up getting her pregnant instead. Since it's my baby she's carrying, I convinced her to stay with my family until the baby comes to term. I'm hoping that even when the baby's born, Shiko will stay there and, you know... Turn over our new leaf? Really? The other woman asked casually. Well, if that's the case, I wish you luck. Kim blinked at the statement. That, that's it? You don't have any more questions or not freaked out by it? Kim, well, you've been in this business as long as I have. It takes a lot more than that to freak you out. So he replied as he sat down. Though, I will admit, I do have some concerns about the situation. You're not the only one. Kim sighed. I'm trying to do my best to keep Shigo calm, and I really think this will change her. I mean... She's already much more relaxed as he used to be. That is one of my concerns. My primary one is for the well-being of your child. That's nice, but I don't think you have to worry. For what Seiko said, the doctor told her the baby is healthy. That's not what I meant, Dr. Director said, slipping into her commander voice again. It's not? Kim, if we found out about this, then others can well as well. People tend to talk when two former enemies start acting nice towards each other. If word of Seagull's condition spreads out throughout the fellow community, well, I shudder to think of what will happen. Again, Kim was shot to the silence. This, too, was something she knew what she was thought about, but didn't get around to. The other woman was right, though. If any of her villains found out that Shigo was the one carrying, they'd be relentless in their attacks. Even with her skills and Ron's help, she didn't know she could stop them all. What's worse, she knew Seagull would want to defend herself without endangering the baby. This was a sense she was definitely not worthy for. Her. I'm sorry to have worried you, Dr. Director spoke, breaking Kim's thoughts. But this is the reality you have to face. I... I know. I just need time to plan some things. I'm sure Wade can come up with some things to keep an eye on Shigo, but... Beyond that, I don't know what to do right now. I... I need to sleep on it. The head of Global Justice nodded. You're right. It is late. And I should have just waited until morning to bring you here. I'm sorry. But as he said... Now that you have it on your mind, you can think about what you're going to do. As a third, we here at Global Justice will do everything we can to make sure your baby is safe. Thank you, Kim said softly. 
After all the times you saved the world, it's the least you could do. You should probably get going and get some sleep. Looks like you will need it. Kim nodded slowly, then stood up, shook the woman's hand again. As he walked towards the double doors, it was greeted by Will once more, who we'll headed her off to another agent that would escort her home. Once they were out of sight, Will stepped into the office. I take it you were listening? Dr. Director said matter of factly. Do you think she was telling the truth? He asked. I think so, yes. From what I've seen, Kim's not a very good liar. It goes against who she is. Personally, I would like to see her succeed at reforming Seiko. Oh? Think about it, Will. We both know that these women are capable of. Now imagine that they're fighting on the same side. Our side. To top it all off, they now have a child to raise, which would make anyone fight harder than before. Will's eyes grew wide at his new source of information. Dr. Director caught this and smirked. My point, she remarked. Her face grew serious. Personally, that also means Kim won't have as much time to do world saving bit. We're going to need to step it up on our end. How are things going with the squad? There are still things to be ironed out, but going well, Will informed her. Although, I'm not sure if it's a good idea to associate ourselves with those types. Times change, Will, and we will have to change with them if we want to keep peace. What about the other girl? We're keeping taps on her. But to be completely off it is, I don't think she's anywhere near Kim's level. Dr. Director smirked again. I'd be careful, Will. Sound completely like a compliment. Dr. Du Ancient Dew blocked at the remark, caused his boss to give out a small chuckle. There's no life yet to be brought into this world, Will. Let's do our best to make it a safe place. Kim tried to stifle a yawn as she walked through the door of her house, but failed miserably. As she stumbled through the living room, she noticed that the TV was on again. But the vine turned down low. She went to investigate the vine Seagull laying on the couch, with the remote still clutched in the hand lying on the floor. She couldn't help but smile as she looked down at the sleeping woman. Her left hand rested only protectively over the small bowls in her stomach. She watched the lights from the TV flicker over Seagull's pale screen, creating strange patterns as it did so. In her sleep, Seagull looked so peaceful it was hard to believe she was the same person that helped Dr. Dragon place her in all those elaborate death traps. She looked far apple too, a word Kim knew she hated to be associated with. Well, the only thing she could think of to describe her at this moment. Peaceful, far apple, and glowing. Not just from the light on the TV, but or the way your plasma were powers, but an air glow that seemed to come along with being pregnant. At least that's what she thought. Either way, it was nice to see it and actually seemed to appear bigger and more beautiful. Wait a minute, Kim thought. Did I just use the word beautiful in regards to Shigo? Dr. Director was right, I do need sleep. She was about to leave when she looked down to sleeping Seagull again, focusing mostly on her left hand, most importantly what was under it. She remembered the other thing the Pat's woman said to her, and a cold chill ran down her spine. Eventually, her enemies would find out she would have not just the fight of life on her hands, but the life for baby and Shigo. She sighed before she suddenly rested a hand over Shigo's. I don't know what's going to happen when this gets out, but I promise I'll protect you. She gave the hand and the balls a gentle squeeze. Both of you. And no, people, she didn't kiss her to sleep. I'm sorry, I want her to kiss her goodnight, too. I want her Kim to kiss Chico on the forehead at this moment, too, because this scene is so set up for a good romantic moment, but it's not happening. My apologies. Still, this is going to make for an interesting Sunday material. See you later.